So glanthine is a naturally occurring alkaloid that the daffodils produce. It causes an enzyme imbalance in the brain, which is the opposite of the Alzheimer's enzyme imbalance in the brain. In Wales, daffodils are a national symbol. They've bloomed in these lands for thousands of years, inspiring poets, artists and historians and becoming an indelible part of Welsh culture. They also have roots in early medicine. There are records of plants of the same type being used to treat cancer in ancient Greece. But it's modern science that could make these flowers have the most powerful influence on our lives yet. I've come to the Black Mountains in Powys, Wales, to find out why the flowers blooming all around me could hold the key to treating one of the world's deadliest diseases. Kevin Stevens' family has farmed this land for five generations. This is an incredible moment to be on hand for because Kevin is a sheep farmer by trade. And right now, there are newborn lambs arriving by the minute. That's incredible. Hi, Kevin, nice to meet you. Hi. I've caught you at a busy time. It's a very busy time of the year. And alongside the sheep farming, which is what you traditionally do here, I hear there's another side to, to what you're doing. Indeed, we've got an entirely different enterprise uh, using daffodils to produce an Alzheimer's drug, which is completely complementary to what we've been doing with the sheep for generations. Alzheimer's is the biggest cause of dementia, a collection of neurological symptoms that affects more than 55 million people around the world. The condition can destroy your memory, leaving you unable to think and carry out basic activities. Every three seconds, somebody in the world develops dementia. It's the seventh leading cause of death globally. And as the world's population grows, it will affect millions more people every year. In 2004, biology professor Trevor Walker started researching Alzheimer's treatments and discovered something he called the Black Mountains effect. He found that daffodils grown at 1,400 feet in the Welsh mountains produced high levels of a chemical called galanthamine. Kevin read about the professor's work in a magazine and realised he could help make a difference. So they joined forces to start a company together. Wow. Well, that's beautiful. What is galanthamine? How is it used? So galanthamine is a naturally occurring alkaloid that the daffodils produce to protect themselves from grazing livestock. It causes an enzyme imbalance in the brain, which is the opposite of the Alzheimer's enzyme imbalance in the brain. So if we get the dose right, we restore equilibrium and um, slow the progression of the disease. This hill looks very different to all of the hills around it in that it's yellow tinged thanks to the daffodils. What makes these daffodils just so hardy? That's the interest in part because it's the stress response from the environment conditions that elicit the higher levels of the alkaloid that we're after. It's that they are not liking the experience that gives us the glanthamine we need. That they're having to grow in a pretty windy, high altitude terrain. Windy, high altitude, high exposure, low temperature, difference in light, there's a whole basket of environmental factors that come with growing daffodils on top of the mountain, but that makes the result we need. So you've ripped up the rule book, this is not where daffodils should be grown, but actually growing them here is the reason that they're so successful. That's exactly right, but the daffodils aren't the end point. We are here growing glanthamine, so the rule book is for growing flowers. We've had to invent our own rule book to produce glanthamine. People with Alzheimer's disease often have lower levels of chemicals known as neurotransmitters, which allows crucial brain cells to function properly and communicate with one another. One of these is acetylcholine. The disease can lead to brain cells being damaged, including those that produce and use acetylcholine. And this is why the symptoms can get worse over time. There's currently no cure, 
but it is possible to slow down the symptoms of Alzheimer's and this is where galanthamine comes in. It stops an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase from breaking down acetylcholine and it enhances the chemical's effect on certain receptors, which leads to better communication between brain cells. That can help ease certain Alzheimer's symptoms. Using galanthamine to treat Alzheimer's isn't new. In certain cases, it's been available in its synthetic form as a prescription drug. Professor Walker's friend and collaborator David Palmer lost his wife Diane to Alzheimer's several years ago. Hello, Mr Palmer, how are you? I'm fine, how are you? Very well, thank you. I've been hearing lots about how your late wife was the inspiration for much of what we've been hearing about. Can I ask you to tell us a bit about her? Yes, yes. Well, we've been married for almost 50 years. She was a very easygoing person and friendly to everybody. And it's well known that when you've got Alzheimer's, you tend to revert to your almost child character. But she just slowly went. And obviously in the last four or five years, she didn't know who she was. She didn't know who I was, didn't know who the kids were. It was a life experience, but a very hard one. How did uh, taking galanthamine um, help your wife's symptoms? It delayed the onset. But I think without those medicines, um, the deterioration would have been quicker, I'm quite confident. And when, when she was first put on to it, there was almost a little uptick and improvement for a certain period. It was David's wife, Diane, who inspired Professor Walker to help Alzheimer's patients by pushing for more galanthamine to be sourced directly from daffodils. How did your experience with your wife and Alzheimer's spark the idea for all of this? Well, I think in fairness, um, uh, uh, Trevor Walker, who was the scientist, already knew something about this area, that most of the product is synthesized, but a natural version of the product is actually, if anything, superior. And eventually, if you could uh, get to produce it very economically in the field, you could uh, produce it much more cheaply. And this would then be useful throughout the world where perhaps the costs are a little bit prohibitive. Synthetic galanthamine dominates the market. However, the manufacturing process can generate a lot of waste and produce molecular variants that can cause harmful side effects, such as stomach and bowel problems. So the interesting thing about this, Kevin, is that synthetic galanthamine is out there, but you're really interested in the naturally occurring stuff. Yes, that's right. The daffodils produce natural galanthamine, pure, 100%. Uh, the right shape and form. Whereas when you're um, making it artificially, you start off with a, a simple molecule and bolt on a nitrogen or a hydrogen or a carbon. And there are a number of choice points in that construction of the glanthamine molecule where the next piece can come on from the wrong direction. So not all glanthamine is the same? No. A big problem with um, a large part of the galanthamine that uh, gets synthesized is that it contains impurities where the, the various components are tweaked in a different way, so it's not galanthamine. So as a result, you end up with that side effect profile because of the impurities, not because of galanthamine. And that's why natural galanthamine is considered the, the premium product as far as the pharmaceutical industry is concerned. Understanding the basic building blocks of substances like galanthamine is really important. It's called structural biology and it's all about studying things at a molecular level. Knowing how these substances are shaped helps us understand how they work, which means we can design medicines to better target diseases. While natural galanthamine is said to be the premium alternative, finding the right growing conditions and cultivation knowledge isn't easy to come by. So when Kevin came across Professor Walker's work, the timing was just right. You've got a long history of being linked to this land. Your family go back many years here, many generations. So how do you get from this initial idea, the uh, prospect of, of this, to what we can now see, which is a carpet of daffodil flowers? We are looking at a generational change in UK agriculture. 
with Brexit and the changes to farm support. So the idea was to take the professor's discovery and produce a viable additional income for hill farmers. The uphill struggle has been the technology. Everything we've tried that was industry standard just didn't work. And we've had to reinvent every step from identifying which varieties to grow right the way through to crystallizing pure galanthamine. There are 30,000 varieties of daffodils. Kevin had to work out which was the right one to grow and how to plant them in the hard and uneven ground without breaking his equipment. So he designed and built a machine himself. And how does it work? The bulbs come forward on this belt here. The disc slits the pasture for the bulbs to drop down into. And at the other end, we have a couple of roller wheels which squash it down flat. And so this is the only one of its kind in the world? Yes. Planting daffodils into grass is a unique concept, but it works with sheep farming because the sheep don't eat daffodils. So the grass will keep the weeds down and the sheep will keep the grass down. Once ready, the daffodils are harvested with another machine that also had to be invented from scratch. They're then kept in storage before being taken to a biochemistry lab where the galanthamine is extracted. Well, here we take the juice. So the galanthamine and all the other alkaloids will stick to this resin and all the other molecules will pass through. And the next step is to concentrate the volume. And this is the machine here? Yeah, this is called um, a wiped film evaporator and it basically takes um, the volume down to about a quarter of what we start off with. The technology here isn't new, but the way it's used had to be adapted because daffodils can produce around 300 alkaloids and many of them are toxic. So the galanthamine must be safely separated using this machine. So how does it work? So it works on a, a biphasic solvent system. So this is two solvents that don't mix together. The galanthamine is more soluble in one of the layers than the other, that we exploit that to purify the galanthamine. How quickly is this spinning? Um, it will spin up to 1600 RPM. Okay, so that's going very, very quickly that's indeed. Quite fast, yeah. So we would now start pumping the daffodil juice through and then collect the fractions that come out here. Now that we have the pure galanthamine, the final step for Colin is to remove the solvent from the extract. And then what is left in this flask is a white crystalline material that is the pure galanthamine. Is this a process you'd have to go through if you were using synthetic galanthamine or is this specifically because it's coming from the daffodil? This is uh, specifically because it comes from a natural source. Natural sources tend to be a lot more complicated than synthetic sources. So in an extract, you could have thousands of different chemicals that need to be extracted and purified. A Canadian company is preparing to release galanthamine in North America as part of an over-the-counter food supplement called Sabella. The pill includes several other natural substances and is meant to improve brain health. If it's successful, Kevin hopes to release it in the UK, making it available to people without a medical prescription. And so these little capsules will be taken much like cod liver oil or other supplements by anyone? Yeah, so they're non-prescription and they are not in any way a medicine. They are purely a supplement to help your brain, help avoid the effects of aging on the brain. How much benefit does this one pill hold? The benefit uh, from Sabella isn't uh, a single hit, it's an accumulative effect. On day one, you probably wouldn't notice anything, but you should start to feel the benefits um, by the end of the first month, six weeks, two months. It should really start to um, make your brain function better. It's been a long journey from the field to the pharmacy, but does the pill actually work? Our next stop is Aberystwyth, a seaside town on the Welsh coast where leading scientists at the local university are testing Sabella along with other medicines and what they call foods of the future. Hi, Dr. Lloyd. Hey. Nice to meet you, I'm Raya. And you? So this is WARU, so this is the Wellbeing and Health Assessment Research Unit. And so here is where you put the scientific stamp of approval on food's health benefits. Yes, companies need further research and development around their products. A lot of companies believe that their food and their drink 
or supplements will enhance health, but they have no evidence. So we can provide that. We can provide that pilot data to say, well, this changes or this alters, or there is a possible health benefit, you know, we need to explore further. If the trial comes out and there's no change, there's no health benefit, then the company can go off and actually explore other avenues. Dr Lloyd and her team currently have 40 participants signed up to the Sabella trial, monitoring a range of cognitive and medical variables. So what is it you're actually testing with these blood trials? We're looking at the, the, the global chemical composition, so it's the, the metabolome. So we're looking to see what changes. So the first thing we're going to get you to do is an eyes open, closed task. So this will just allow us to obtain a baseline measurement of your brain. So They're testing the pill's effects on the brain through what's known as an EEG, or electroencephalogram. So the testing you're doing is looking at whether Sabella actually sharpens the brain and if you can scientifically prove that. Yeah, exactly. So it's definitely a more scientific approach. Okay, so we're just going to put this in the middle of your forehead here. The EEG cap is fitted to the test participant, connecting small sensors to the scalp to detect brain waves. This is then connected to an amplifier, which monitors and records activity in different regions of the brain. We're particularly interested in looking at attention, um, inhibition control, working memory, all that sort of stuff, just because it gives us a broad idea of overall cognitive function. And it also just strengthens our understanding about the neural networks going on beneath. Without trials like these, it would be difficult to prove that natural products like galanthamine are ultimately useful. And they require a lot of data. But getting enough test subjects can be a problem. So Dr Lloyd and her team have invented their own mobile testing kits. So this is an at-home kit where they'll, it get, gets posted with some instructions of when to collect the actual urine samples. The idea behind this being that you get past the barriers that are stopping people getting involved with your research. Yeah, when we're, it's outreach to those um, individuals that wouldn't normally be part of trials, that we, you wouldn't normally be able to collect data from deprived areas because they're not, they can't come to the, 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 the centre. You know, individuals with disabilities, older individuals, they can do things at home. So it's wider outreach, a more diverse population. The knock-on effect of testing supplements like Sabella can mean opening the door to more research into other Alzheimer's treatments. That means bigger trials and potentially better results. We're working within health and human cohorts. And then once we've established that there is change, we can move that into different demographics, especially individuals with cognitive issues such as Alzheimer's and, and dementia. Farming here is an ancient tradition and has defined lives and livelihoods in Wales for centuries. But could the future of Welsh farming really lie in modern medicine? Kevin thinks galanthamine is just the beginning. Scientists are now looking into whether another daffodil extract has anti-cancer properties. And there are signs some compounds in the flower can be used to prevent heart disease. How many people potentially could benefit from all of these flowers? The daffodils in this field would produce enough galanthamine to treat 9,000 people for a year. Um, and then there's another field over there. And as we scale it up, we can treat more and more people. The natural world produces a whole range of very important and powerful medicinal compounds. Mm -hmm.